my name is Brett Warner. If you're new here, I'm the pastor of Intercultural Ministries, and I just want to welcome you guys all to join with us in worship today. So, um, got a few things to make note of. Uh, I mentioned this last week, but we have a photographer here today just kind of capturing some pictures um, to update our website and other resources we have. So, if you see him around, just ignore him. Pretend like he's not there. Worship the Lord. Everything's normal. Um, so we're just getting some good new updated pictures of our services. So um, yeah, I got a few things uh, want to talk about. Uh, we have Easter coming up next week, which Steve will mention more in the message about the details of next weekend. But I want to invite Trisha Shimp up. Trisha is our children's ministry coordinator. Um, so yeah, let's give her a hand. So welcome, Trisha. Good morning. So... Oh, okay, he's on. Okay, well, sweet. Um, well, yeah, so we wanted to just talk about there, Easter there we go. service. Okay, Good there morning. we go. <laughs> there we go. Hi, um, guys. Yeah, so I was just going to introduce you guys to what we're doing for our kids next Sunday morning. If you look in your bulletin, uh, we have Easter. It's the IK Zone, Emmanuel Kids Zone. It's going to be held in the Fellowship Hall starting at 10 a.m. So if you are a kid or if you have kids, you want to join us because we'll have some games, a craft, and just some fun things for the kids to do at 10 o'clock. We're not meeting for the 9 o'clock discipleship hour, so you want to have the kids here at 10 o'clock. Awesome. Thank you, Tricia. Yeah. Um, so that is what Easter Sunday is looking like. What does a typical Sunday look like for kids' ministry? Right. So um, if you look on the back of your bulletin, you'll see what our Sunday mornings uh, consist of, all the ways uh, that the, your kids can get engaged here on a Sunday morning at 9 o'clock and 1030. Um, because we have, offer such great kids' ministry for our kids, uh, we do need some more volunteers. So if you are here during those times, would you consider being a part of our children's ministry? It takes 26 people on a Sunday morning wow. to run our kids' ministry, but from nursery through grade five. So that takes a lot of people, because some of our uh, schedules are rotating, and some of our schedules uh, are... It, volunteers show up every Sunday morning for. So if you have some space and some time and you think that you want to come and serve with us, please contact me. My information is on our insert. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, Trisha does a great job um, with our children's ministry. So let's just give her a hand. Um, yeah. Thank you, Trisha. All right. Um, so today is Palm Sunday. Um, so it's the Sunday before Jesus was crucified and rose again. Um, so this is the Sunday that he was walking into Jerusalem. And as he walked in to Jerusalem, we know the story where he uh, was welcomed as a king. And so we are going to welcome him as a king this morning. We are going to worship King Jesus. So we're going to start with the account of Palm Sunday um, on yeah, Matthew 21. So we'll have the passage up there. You can follow along as I'm reading it. And when we get to the part where the people are praising Jesus, crying out Hosanna, let's all cry that out together and read it together. Um, and then we're going to worship the Lord. So it says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed the cloaks on the, for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, and here we go, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heavens. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. 
So we are going to worship the God who saves this morning. So if you want to stand up and join in song, we're going to praise Jesus who's exalted in the highest.
Jesus, would you come and would you have your way in us this morning? We come, Lord Jesus, and we worship you. We give you our praise and we give you our glory, your glory. We exalt you as king. We lift up your name, Jesus.
just a couple minutes ago, we read the passage from Matthew 21 where it talks about the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And the people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And they were declaring him as the King of Kings and giving him the praise and the exaltation that he deserved as King. But we know just in, sh in uh, five short days, the public opinion changed, didn't it? He was taken, he was, he was put on trial. He was beaten. He died. He died for you and for me. And he paid the debt that we deserve. He was sinless so that we could be free. He paid for your sin and for mine and he was buried. But we know he didn't stay there. He rose three days later, and we're going to get to celebrate that next week. He rose from the dead, and he is now seated in heaven. And he is being worshipped day and night. In Revelation, God gave John a picture of what that looks like. He gave him a picture of the throne room of heaven. And I've been uh, in my own quiet time just reflecting on what this looks like. And I've just been amazed at, at the picture that God gives us. In our human minds, we can't even grasp what that is. He gives us details of images and of people. But we can't wrap our minds around. Scripture says that there were thousands upon thousands, 10,000 times 10,000 angels surrounding the throne in worship of our God and our Savior, our King. That kind of worship is going on right now in heaven. And one day, if we are a child of God, we get to join him and we get to worship him day and night. But I believe that the Lord wants us to experience just a glimpse of this here on earth. Oh, how I would love to see just a slice of that, just a glimpse of that, and get to worship him. And I believe that he would do that for us. So in the next couple of minutes, we're going to read a portion of Revelation. And it's going to set the stage. It's going to give us just a part of it. And I just want to invite you to try to picture what this looks like. Allow the word of God to lead you into a deeper insight of him, a deeper appreciation of him, a deeper worship of him. And if we ask the Lord to do it, I know that he can open up our eyes. He can give us what we can't have in ourselves, our spiritual eyes, our physical eyes, our minds. So I'm going to pray that right now. And I just want to ask you to join us. Lord Jesus, would you illuminate the scriptures right now. Jesus, would you open up our eyes, our physical eyes, our spiritual eyes, our minds and our hearts to see more of you. Lord, this is not about us. This is about you. And Jesus, would this lead us into greater worship of you, Jesus? Would you bring heaven down onto earth just for a short time, Jesus? Give us a glimpse, a picture of what is happening there, Jesus. And Lord, would we respond in that this morning, Jesus? Come, lead us. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face of a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor 
and power. For you created all things, and by your will, they were created and have their being. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousands times ten thousands. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped
adore him give him praise right where you are worship him
hearts are filled with praise and worship and adoration and thanksgiving for your good your majestic Jesus the one who rode humbly on a donkey into Jerusalem one day you would come as the king of kings and lord of lords and every knee will bow down and every tongue will confess father god but then we don't want to wait for that day we want to cry out today If you don't cry out even the rocks will shout your praise. We worship you and we praise you God. Father even as we listen to your word we pray to you God that you would prepare our hearts. You would make it a receptive soil where your word can fall and grow 30 60 and 100 fold. May your name be honored and glorified. We give you all the glory. In Jesus most wonderful and matchless name we pray. Amen.
Folks, it's wonderful to have uh, our family here together on this good uh, on this Palm Sunday, as we are preparing for our week ahead. Here, as we walk through uh, the last week of Jesus's life and remember what He did for us, and I encourage you to be uh, reading, studying, praying, reflecting this week as we move toward Good Friday and Easter. And so, uh, I want to call your attention to what we are, how we're celebrating this next weekend. Uh, so Good Friday is coming up here in just five days. So 6.30 on Good Friday, we're going to be having a worship service here together that will remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. Actually, it'll be the, the message of the three crosses. You have Jesus between two thieves. And uh, we will see how uh, Christ gave his life for us. And we'll be celebrating communion together. So in lieu of doing communion this morning, we'll be doing that uh, coming up this Friday night uh, together. So we really encourage you to come, bring family, bring friends, and let's uh, celebrate Christ's death for us, remembering the price that was paid that we might have his salvation free for us. And then on Easter morning, a week from today, we're going to be celebrating uh, together Christ's resurrection. And the service time is the normal time at 1030 but we want to make you aware that you need to come earlier than 1030, right? So uh, if you want to come for a, a time of prayer, we encourage you to come at 930 to, to gather up to pray. You're going to pray for the Sunday um, uh, service, pray through the building here, uh, pray just celebrating about Christ's uh, resurrection. By 10 o'clock, we assume all of y'all are going to be here uh, because you don't want to miss out on the good coffee, it's good coffee, like specialty coffee, and donuts, and just a time to be together as a church family on that Easter morning. So uh, we're going to have all the, the foyer doors will be open, the fellowship hall will be open here, people just kind of gathering, talking, and being together on Easter morning, and then we will begin our celebration at 1030, and we will be having uh, two baptisms, or three baptisms that morning, so we're excited for that. Yeah. Uh, people who are going to declare that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. So looking forward to that. And it's going to be a full house next week. It's full today as well, but next week will be even fuller, if that's a word. Uh, so you'll, we need you to come and, and, and fill up the front rows. So right now, actually, probably the most space in the room is these first couple of rows. Uh, we'd love for you to sit closer here. We'd also encourage, if you are able, to park over here on Moomaw Avenue to make space for our parking lot over here. And uh, we'll work together to fit as many uh, people as we can to worship uh, together next Sunday. This might be our last year of doing one service on Easter. We might have to change that in, in the years to come. But uh, we praise God for that's a good problem to have, isn't it? Amen. All right. Well, this morning we are going to get into the Ten Commandments uh, series again. We've been working through those, and today we're on commandment number four. And uh, commandment number four is one that's, uh, at its core is short and sweet and simple. Keep the Sabbath. It's on your bulletin. That's the title of this morning's message. But this, this commandment, out of all the other commandments, is probably the most misunderstood. Uh, what does it mean to keep the Sabbath? Is this still something we need to do? And, and, and sure, people are like, yeah, don't lie, don't cheat, don't murder. Th those still apply today. But what about the Sabbath? Does this still apply to us Today, in fact, on recent polls over the last couple of years, uh, multiple polls have found that only half of Christians would say that the Sabbath has any meaning for us here today. And so what does God have to say about it? And I'm looking forward to digging in together with you. So turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. Here we see the giving of the Ten Commandments. It's uh, through Moses uh, in, on Mount Sinai to God's people as they had been led out of Egypt and now are in the wilderness at Mount Sinai. We're going to be reading verses 8 through 11 today of Exodus chapter 20. So follow along as I read. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, 
the sea, and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Here's the command. Keep the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, which means to be set apart, to be dedicated completely unto the Lord. The seventh day is to be for the Lord. Now, as you look at this passage here, uh, who is this command given to? Who, who is supposed to keep the Sabbath as you look at it? Go ahead and, and, and look through, especially verses 10. Uh, around verse 10 probably has most information about it. Who, who's supposed to keep the, the, the Sabbath? I'm hearing the word everyone. A little more specific. God's people, the Israelites who it was written to originally, right? And who else is listed in there? There's servants, the manservants, the maidservants, the animals. I can imagine the animals like chilling out on the Sabbath day, like, oh, yeah. You know, that's what they do every day, right? But uh, animals, uh, and, and it says even the, the foreigners who are among you. Everyone who's part of the, the Israelite community should obey the Sabbath. They were not to do any work during the seventh day. Now, God gave them actually a miracle that they would see every week to remind them how serious God was about this, right? So you know how they were fed in the wilderness. They found food on the ground. It was called manna. It was kind of a bread-like substance, a sweet sweet bread that they would find uh, on the mornings. They would go out, and boom, there it is. They would go out. They'd have their jar. They would collect enough for that day, and then they would have food for their family, and they could eat it all day long. Now, God told them, don't pick up any more than you need for that day, because if you keep it in your jar overnight, in the morning you're going to wake up and the manna is not going to be so good. It's going to have expired uh, in the morning when you, <laughs> some of you get that reference, uh, when you, and you pick it up, it's, it's going to be rotten and stinking, there's going to be maggots in there, and so don't pick up enough for two days, only get enough for one. However, on the sixth day, go out and gather enough manna on the ground for you to have for the seventh day, because on that morning, on the Sabbath, when you wake up and you've got that extra manna in the jar, guess what? It's going to be good as new. That's a miracle. How can it be that six days it would spoil, but on the seventh day it does not spoil? That's a miracle from God. And the other miracle that happens on the Sabbath is they go outside, and guess what? There's no manna on the ground. Six days there's manna, on the seventh day there isn't. Every week they had a miracle in front of their eyes to remind them to keep the Sabbath. God was that serious about it. It's pretty amazing. Don't do any work, don't labor, don't do the routine that you do all the other days. And now verse 11 gives us the foundation for why to keep the Sabbath. Look at it with me. It says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. This is rooted in the story of creation. This goes all the way back to the very first chapter of Genesis as God made the heavens and the earth. We're told all about those six days as God created the light, and then he created the, the sun, the moon. He created, he created the land separated from the water. He created the things that fly in the air and the fish that swim in the sea. He created plants and animals and then human beings. Now, on that seventh day, as God rested, was he tired? Did he, did he go to that seventh day like, oh, man, like, I've been working hard all these six days. I, I need a rest. I need a nap. Like, woof, this is too much for me. God doesn't get tired, right? He's omnipotent. He has all power. He doesn't sleep or slumber. So what is going on here that God would rest on the seventh day? And this gives us a window into God's heart in this commandment here, what we see is that God is the all-sufficient one who works on our behalf, who, who does what is needed to be done for us, and then he created rest as a gift. And we're going to explore what that gift is, but God created rest for us. Listen, he created something each of the six days. It was work. It was creative work. It was detailed work. In fact, the human body 
uh, for an average adult uh, has one and a half gallons of blood pumping through their, their body at all times. So picture that going on right now in your body, your heart's circulating this around. All of your blood vessels in your body, there are 60,000 miles of blood vessels in your body. God made that. His, his creativity, his, his power is so amazing that he could do that for us. But on the seventh day, he rested. Even in resting, even though he didn't need to, God created something on the seventh day, didn't he? He didn't create something physical, but actually God created rest by resting. Interesting, isn't it? We say God created the first six days. He didn't create on the He actually did create on that seventh day. He created something called rest. He created this pattern of work, 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 now rest. There's forever a delineation between work and and rest. There's this, this pattern we see. It's almost like breathing in and breathing out. We, we breathe in, we work, 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 and then on the last day, we, we exhale. It's, it's a pattern that God has put into all of creation. It's something that we need to consider. This is before there was ever sin in the world. This is before there was any law given in the world. This is inherent into the fabric of creation that God has put rest into our world. In fact, we have it every day, if we think about it. There's more than just the seventh day of rest. There's daylight in the day, and most human beings, unless they're insomniacs or work overnight, are alert and awake during the day. They do their things, and then at night when it gets dark and in the late hours, we sleep. Our bodies aren't made to run 24-7 for six days and then sleep for the seventh day. There's actually patterns of rest built into every day. There's even patterns you, we should put into spending time in Scripture, spending time in prayer, resting in the Lord every day. And then we come to the seventh day and we do it even more especially. There's patterns to the day. In fact, the Lord even gave Israel some more commands about rest in Leviticus 25, we hear that, that God told the Israelites, when you plant your fields, farm them for six years, and on the seventh year, there's going to be a Sabbath year. Let your fields go fallow so that the field does not produce on that seventh year. And if it happens to produce anything, great, but you don't work that field. He also commanded something called the year of Jubilee, not to be confused with the Jubilee Day that happens in Mechanicsburg in June. That is the nation's largest street fair east of the Mississippi River. It happens in Mechanicsburg every June. Not to be confused with that. This is the year of Jubilee, which is the 50th year. There are 49 years. That's seven sevens. So you guys hear the number seven getting repeated. It's, it's a, a number that, that God uses a lot. Uh, seven years times seven, 49 years. On the 50th year, it's called the year of Jubilee. And what happens on the year of Jubilee is that the Israelites were to cancel all debts that had been accrued in the first 49 years. They weren't paid off yet. Cancel them. Any slaves that you had acquired during that time, they should be set free unless they want to voluntarily stay with you. They can be set free. Any land that had been bought or sold during that time gets to go back to the people who were the original owners. And if you remember, as God took them into the promised land, the, each of the tribes were assigned different areas, and each of the families of those tribes had land, and they were supposed to go back to the original owners. So God has this pattern of rest and reorder, reprioritizing, built into the calendar of the Israelites, built into the pattern even of creation. Peace, reorder, recreation. That's God's heart in this idea of the Sabbath. He wants for us to be able to experience his peace, his rest, his reorder. Which is why at the very end of verse 11 it says that the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So by now, you should be thinking, okay, this has to be more than just something for the 
Israelites in the Old Testament. This has to be something that, since God did it at creation, has to be put into the order of our own lives. Well, let's think about it a little bit more. We're reading here in Exodus 20 in the context of the first 19 chapters. And if you come back to the very beginning of the book of Exodus, where are the the people of Israel? They're slaves in Egypt. They're under the control of a pharaoh who is using them to build his cities, his roads, maybe his pyramids. They are an economic tool to further on the wealth of the Egyptian empire. Let me ask you, in, in the 400 years that they've been slaves, how many days off do you think they got? Probably not very many. It, it's possible they had some. It's possible that, that there were periodic days and times the Egyptians didn't even want to be uh, overseeing them. So maybe there were times where, where they got to have days off. But it probably was not very often. There was no seven-day pattern in the Egyptian calendar. So here they are. They're God's people He rescues them out of Egypt. They've been defined by their work all these 400 years. They're only valuable by what they can produce. God delivers them out of Egypt. They're coming out into the wilderness. And all of a sudden, God actually commands them, take a day off every week. Isn't that a wonderful gift God is giving them? They haven't known this for 400 years. They've they've been slaves. They've they've been performing and producing. There's been expectations on them for all these years. And God says, now I want you to live as free people. I want you to, to experience something that I had created in the first place. I want you to know that you are my sons and my daughters. You're not defined by what you do and what you produce You're defined by me, your loving king over top of you. Ruth Haley Barton writes in in a book, she says, By instituting the Sabbath, God intervened in human history to make something right that had gone terribly wrong and reestablished a pattern present in creation that had been tragically lost. And she continues, In the Exodus narrative, the God who is free to rest on the seventh day is calling the people God loves to participate in his freedom by embedding it in their national identity. Keep that that screen up here for for just a moment. Think think about this. The, The God who is free to rest on the seventh day, he didn't need to, but he's free to, is calling his people now to participate in his freedom. I don't have to work in order to be valued. I don't have to work in order to be loved. I don't have to work in order to be God's people. I get to rest because I am God's people. That's an amazing truth he was putting into their lives. Remember that I saved you. Remember that I have set you free. Now live like free people. The same practice is still relevant for us today. God wants for us to know that we are free people, that we are his people, that he is our God. And so by keeping a day of rest, we are actually able to participate in the same freedom that God did by realizing everything that I have have received these six days is a gift from God. Everything that he does in my life, he's the one who's all sufficient. He's the one who provides for my needs. I worship him. That's what a Sabbath is about. Everything we have, our health, our life, the energy to even work, the provisions that we have, we are dependent beings on a God who gives us all things. And it's not just even for the physical things that God gives us. It's especially true for the spiritual things that God gives us. In Hebrews 4, we studied last year, right about this time, we were early on in the book of Hebrews. So Hebrews chapter 4 uh, talked about how God helps, uh, he has given us the invitation to enter his Sabbath rest. But in that context, it's not talking about the seventh day of the week. It's talking about a rest in Christ. That Christ has done all the work for us and now we rest in him. Next week is Easter. 
So we're going to remember that Christ came to this earth. He walked in our shoes. He lived the life that none of us could. He lived it perfectly. He fulfilled the law perfectly. And as an innocent one, he was taken to the cross. And he paid for all of our sins. Hallelujah. What Christ has done for us. We've praised him this morning already for that. But then he rose from the dead and conquered death and sin and Satan. And he has won the victory. And now he has ascended into the right hand of the Father and sat down. And he has, what, rested from his work. And we get to rest now in Christ. Let let me ask you, do, do your good works get you into heaven? Do your good works get you into a relationship with Christ? Can you, can you make uh, enough efforts to do good things that will outweigh the bad things, the sin in your life that hopefully somehow tips the scales so that I, I can hope that I'm, I'm good enough? No, the scripture is very clear. All of our good works are like filthy rags. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is a gift from God. So we rest even in Christ for our own salvation. And even as we work, Scripture tells us that we don't labor in our own strength. We labor through the power of Christ that so wonderfully works in us. So our life is learning to rest in Christ at all times. Everything we've been given is a gift from him, and especially this gift of rest. And The Sabbath day points to a really big Sabbath that's coming up. It's called heaven. Ruth Haley Barton continues in her book and says, Today the weekly Sabbath practiced by God's people points to the greater reality of the ultimate rest God is preparing for us in heaven. Isn't that beautiful? What a thought. Now, in heaven, it doesn't mean we're just going to sit around all day and and do absolutely nothing and play harps sitting on clouds. We're we're, going to have all kinds of things to to do and participate in in the the new glorious kingdom that he is creating for us, a new heavens and a new earth. And and, and the kind of relationships we're going to have are going to be wonderful and fulfilling and perfect. And and we will probably even have work to do, but it won't be the same kind of laborious work like God had cursed the earth and said, through toil and strain, you're going to have your food. There's going to be thorns in the ground and thistles. and It won't be like that. It's going to be wonderful work, good work. It's going to be in complete union with the Lord, enjoying what he has made for us in heaven. So there's a Sabbath rest coming forever that won't be the kind of hard work we're used to doing here by the sweat of our brow. Anybody happy for that? Is there an amen in this house? Um, I'm excited. This is the salvation that God has given us. The, The picture is massive. Do you see it? God is inviting us to Sabbath in order to remember that he's the one who does all these things. He's the one who's preparing this glorious future. Put it into the rhythm of your life to Sabbath. We have this pattern stamped on us. Work, do good work, honest work through his strength, but rest. So this leads us now to the the mirror that God will hold in front of our face. What does this mean for us? Well, if he's the all-sufficient one, then we are dependent beings. The mirror here is that we are dependent beings who worship by resting. We need to worship, we need to rest. And in fact, as we rest in him, we are worshiping him. To take a Sabbath is actually worship to the Lord. You know, Jesus, uh, it, when he was walking the earth, when he was doing his public ministry, he never uh, broke apart the idea of the Sabbath. He never told him, hey, guys, you really don't need to do that. You, you, you really you got the wrong idea here. I kind of meant that for the past. I don't mean this now for, for the future. In fact, Jesus spoke into the Sabbath and shaped the way that it was understood. There was a whole lot of legalism in the Sabbath that he uh, spoke into. 
Uh, you can remember the stories of when Jesus healed people. There's particularly one man, he, he healed him, and he had the man take up his mat and walk. And the Pharisees said, whoa, 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 you're breaking all kinds of rules here. You can't heal on the Sabbath. That, that's work. And that guy can't take up his mat on the Sabbath. That's work. And Jesus said, listen, <laughs> if your child or your ox falls into a ditch on the Sabbath, aren't you going to help them out? Like things of mercy are good on the Sabbath. The things of the Lord are good on the Sabbath. So he reshaped their understanding of that. The disciples were walking through a field and, and they were hungry. They were walking with Jesus and they picked some heads of wheat off of some, some mature stalks of wheat and they took it in their hand. They had to probably rub it to break up the kernels and get the chaff off of it and then they munched on the wheat kernels. And the Pharisees said, whoa, 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 you can't do that. It's the Sabbath. You, you're not allowed to prepare food and, and plus you're reaping and you're winnowing and you're threshing. You can't do those things. And Jesus said, Guys, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, don't look at this as some, some heavy weight that's resting on you that you have to do or else. Think of it as a gift. And he goes, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I made this. And I invite you into Sabbath rest. So, so Jesus spoke into it, and here we still have the invitation today to come to the one who is the Lord of the Sabbath. And I just have to say, I love the idea of Sabbath. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but isn't it awesome to be told by the Lord, you need to pull back. You need to slow down and you need to rest. Uh, so being a pastor, Sundays are usually pretty full days uh, in, in, in our world. So me and all of the other pastors, we take a different day off of the week. And if you're new to Emmanuel, you would discover that if you try to pop in on a Friday, you're not going to find a whole lot of us uh, in the office. Probably none of us, unless we've swapped a day around or something like that. Uh, we take Fridays off. Not that we aren't available for an emergency or a mercy kind of thing. Uh, we are. But, but you're going to probably not get us right away. We're going to be a little bit unreachable uh, to a degree. Right? Um, you're not going to see us here. I, I love the fact that, that Fridays, um, I, I don't have to have the alarm clock set as early. Anybody else like that about, about a day of rest? I, I like that on a Sabbath day, um, I get to maybe be at home instead of out running around everywhere. I like that on a Sabbath day, I might get a little extra time with the Lord because it's been rushed maybe earlier in the week. I like that on a Sabbath day, I get to spend time with my wife and my kids when they come home from school. That's the best part about doing it on a Friday, because they've been off at school. <laughs> They're shaking their heads like, oh, man, yeah. We love spending time with our kids in the afternoon and evening. Yeah. <laughs> I love... Fridays. It, it, I look forward to them every week. It, it's a wonderful gift from God to be able to have a time like that, to have a day that you set apart. You know, the thing I love most about Fridays is that, I don't know if you guys can relate to this, but if you carry a certain role or a certain title or certain expectations through the week, it can kind of feel like that weighs really heavy on you. And it can almost begin to seep into getting intertwined with your identity of who you are. Right? So we, we battle this. I have a title, Pastor Steep. That's not who I am. That's what I do. In, in, in a way, yeah, I don't want to get so black and white with that, but at the root of who I am, it's not, it's not who I am. I am a regular dude who's a follower of Jesus who's also married and has a family. And I love that I get to separate away from that identity. Because the core of who I am, I am saved by Jesus Christ. I'm his son. A Sabbath is a great way to step away from those pressures and expectations and the roles and titles and, and whatever else people make of that. And you just get to be a regular person who's a follower of Jesus. Even at our core, it separates us away from the work to just be able to be a child of God. And I love that reset every week. I love getting to do that. And it, it doesn't happen 
every week the exact way I would like it to. There are times where emergencies come up. There are seasons where things happen. There, there are times where we need to step into something, and, 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 and you don't get it every week. And, and some of you guys who are out there and you're like, man, I don't get that every week because I have a rotating schedule. Or I don't get that every week because um, I, I work like so many hours, and it's so hard. Listen, God's calling us to carve out a day, even if it's a rotating day. He's calling us to carve out, even if you can grab half a day and work toward getting a whole day. He's calling you toward it, to pull away and to rest. It doesn't matter if, you're, if you work a full-time job. It doesn't matter if, if you're a busy homemaker. It doesn't matter if you're a student. There's a way we can all pull back and do less on the Sabbath. And here's another thought to it. The Sabbath isn't just what you're called away from to to get away from work. A Sabbath is also, in verse 10, it says a Sabbath to the Lord. There's two directions to it. Away from this and to him. And so I want to challenge you to to even rethink the way that you look at your your day of, of rest to looking at it as coming to the Lord. And I'm preaching to the choir here. It's Sunday, uh, which is typically now how we celebrate the Sabbath. The, the Jews celebrate it as a Saturday. It was the seventh day of the week. Early in, in, the, in church history, it moved to being celebrated on Sundays, partly because of persecution and partly because it's the day that the Lord rose from the dead. Think about it. He was crucified on a Friday. Jesus was in a tomb on Saturday. He took a Sabbath <laughs> Even on the Sabbath in the tomb, although that was probably also mostly for the other people um, in, in, the, in their life. And then he rose again on Sunday. And so we celebrate that now as, as, our, as our pretty much universally recognized Sabbath day. It's the Lord's day. In, in fact, Revelation 1.10, the Apostle John is receiving this revelation from the Lord. And he says, on the Lord's day, this is what happened. And he's actually saying that that was the first day of the week that they would celebrate remembering the Lord's resurrection. And so this is a pattern we're in, and you guys are here, which is awesome. Uh, You recognize the importance of of coming together for worship to the Lord on Sunday. Some people can't do that on a Sunday, but I really encourage, if you can't take a Sunday, take another day. But Sabbath to the Lord. And what does that mean when we leave here today? What are ways that you can Sabbath unto the Lord? Well, if it's about rest, maybe a nap is the most worshipful thing you can do on a Sunday. That's why I got some amens on that one, right? <laughs> maybe playing worship music in the background at your house. Praying together at your meal. How about having a meal with people, friends, family? There's something about Sabbathing together. That's what the Israelites did, and that's what we do even here. So continue on in community on on a Sunday. How about doing something that recreates? So if if Sabbath is partially about this reorder, this re the word recreation comes from recreate. And so if there's something that recreates, gives you life, maybe it's reading, maybe it's taking a walk. Some people look at taking a walk and they're like, man, I, I, that, that's hard work. I don't even want to do that. Great. But if, if giving, taking a walk is good for you, do it. Think about things that give you life, and that's also good. To do it with the Lord, not apart from the Lord, but if you're taking a hike and you're seeing the beautiful creation, you're going, God, you are just so good. Enjoy him in your hike or whatever it might be. There are lots of ways we can do this. And actually, at this point, I, w- I want to bring up uh, Pastor Randy Corbin. And I'm going to actually get a little bit of perspective because I'm only in my 40s. There's something really good about getting perspective from a longer stretch of history. And so I'm not going to call Randy an older man, but he's, an, he's older than me. And I appreciate his insight. I appreciate his heart. And I think this will be a productive conversation uh, to have about the Sabbath. And so first thing I want to ask, and here's, here's something that, that he will bring that I can't necessarily bring, is what did the Sabbath look like 
many years ago. Like when you were growing up, Randy, what did the Sabbath look like as, as you were growing up in church and in your family and maybe families that you saw around? Okay. Well, <clears throat> I grew up a long time ago, so <laughs> I've got to go back here. It was a quiet day. Of course, we did not have the distractions that were available today. Stores were closed because of the blue laws, so that was not a distraction. And sporting activities were pretty limited. No, no uh, baseball or football or anything on Sundays that conflicted with church and uh, soccer. Well. We didn't even know soccer. I thought it was a guy hitting a girl when I first heard <laughs> When somebody soccer. talked about soccer, soccer. I, we didn't have that in my town. See, this is why I brought him up here. This, this is good, right here. This, we're getting to it right there. <laughs> but generally, it was quiet uh, in that the activities were pretty limited. Family was very important, so we gathered as, as a family in that context. It was also restrictive in many ways. There were uh, limitations on what we could do. Uh, now, my parents did not become followers of Jesus till I was about eight, maybe 10 years old. So a lot of the typical kind of restrictions in that era, era in the church were not uh, something I experienced, but Linda did. Uh, her family uh, made, made it clear, no bike riding, no swimming, no certain kinds of games, even books had to be spiritual books, uh, et cetera. In my family, it was more, uh, we're quiet, we do want you to rest, and not a lot of loud activity in that way. But once my parents became Christians, followers of Jesus, and we tied into a local church. That became our focus on Sabbath, on Sunday. Uh, everything revolved around it. Sunday school was a big deal. In fact, uh, usually there were more people in Sunday school than in church. And in my first church, it was the same. Hmm. Because people really were thrilled about the opportunity to get together to study God's word. Whereas today the statistic is people go to church, what, one Sunday out of four or something like that in some regular yeah. uh, situation. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, we did four out of four. I mean, there was never, rarely a miss. And uh, attendance was so critical that if we did go somewhere to visit, uh, we made sure we went to that church and we asked for what they called a visitor's card that was signed so we could take it back because we wanted perfect attendance. And that was promoted in our whole Sunday school and honored. We had opening assembly every Sunday. We had celebrations of various kinds and celebration of uh, being in church regularly. So su yeah. Sabbath was... Very church focused. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> even our uh, social activity in the church was not carried out on the Lord's Day. It was scheduled other days. Uh, we all dressed. Uh, my family told me we had to look the best. So it was uh, our Sunday go to meet and close. And uh, so we dressed up, everybody dressed up as we went to church. And uh, that was a very vital, important thing. We all had our Bibles. Uh, we all were given Sunday school uh, papers, in which was a memory verse that we were expected to learn during the week, and we were quizzed when we went back. So my memory of sitting in the car on the way to church quickly learning my memory <laughs> verse. And my parents made sure that that was done, checked on us on that. So those were some of the things sure. that our, our Sunday looked like. Yeah. Um, a couple of things you hit on there. I, I, our, our culture has changed so much outside of church, um, hasn't it? I mean, we, nowadays, the way that the world looks at Sunday is it's another Saturday. 
There's a, there's a Saturday that's a, a weekend day and a Sunday that's a weekend day, and there's no distinction between them. And so there's pressure because the world doesn't, doesn't have blue laws, doesn't have the same things for us to navigate. How do, how do we do this? And, and um, you know, you, you want to have a sporting event? Sure, scheduled on Sunday, the same as Saturday, and you just expect people would be okay with that uh, for, for like a, a kid's tournament or whatever it might be. Um, okay, so Randy, talk about the uh, changes that have happened. Uh, there, there are changes maybe for good and maybe some changes that are for the worse throughout the years. What, what do you observe with that? Well, you've touched on one that would be uh, not a good change. And that is, as you've already stated this morning, the Sabbath was given to us as a gift, a gift to humanity that we could recharge and be refreshed. And when we do not uh, enter into that gift, that opportunity, then Monday morning we're as shot as we were Friday night, Mm. and we face the week worn out. And so God gives us that opportunity, and so because people run, run, run all weekend and miss their Sabbath opportunity, they don't have that uh, renewal of energy. I talked to someone probably three years ago encouraging them to consider practicing Sabbath, and they said, well, uh, Saturday and Sunday are my days off, and I don't want to go down to one day off a week. So, but there was a failure to see that all of this is a divine provision for us. Yeah. Uh, Positively, I am thrilled that the church, not just our church, the church, capital C, and particularly the evangelical wing, has really worked to restore us in this whole area of what is Sabbath. That we are called uh, not to rules and regulations, but we are called to relationship with Jesus. That we can use it as an opportunity to grow in him uh, and draw on it. And not about <clears throat> the work of doing, but the work of being. Mm. That, to me, is the most positive thing. I see more writings on this, articles on it, and uh, God has used that to encourage me in that area. Okay. Anything else to add? Changes that are good or bad? I think that the whole area of... Uh, Needing to connect with community is important. <clears throat> God has given us a community. I mean, I could be a singular follower of Jesus if that were possible, but <clears throat> I would miss tremendously the benefit that I get from all of you when I get to interact. Yeah. Uh, Hebrews tells us, uh, let us encourage one another. <clears throat> and when we, when we gather, I can't tell you how many times people here have, maybe not always intentionally, but they've given me a word of encouragement. They've given me some, something that has really been a benefit. And the community of praying together when we have needs and burdens, as the church has done for Linda and me with our granddaughter, a few years ago. Yeah, that's right. So Sabbath gives the opportunity to come together. I mean, I talked to somebody a while back, and they said, well, my Sabbath is walking through the woods. Well, that uh, certainly gives some refreshment to some degree, but Sabbath is whole much more than that. Mm-hmm. And uh, Sabbath is an opportunity to yeah. show love, grace, and to receive it. Yeah, good. Thank you, Randy. Last question, how do you and Linda observe the Sabbath together? What are your practices that you do? Well, I'm sure that there are a number of you in the congregation who do similar things, so I don't want to say that we have it down. Sure. We have a lot lot to learn. But uh, having spent a number of years in ministry, as pastors already indicated, it's a little hard for pastors to take Sunday as a Sabbath. Uh, Since uh, God moved us into retirement, 
Uh, we are delighted that we have a Sabbath with God's people. And as Linda and I gather, our purpose is to seek Jesus. Uh, again, it's not about showing up and letting people see that we're here or that we've been here or we're involved, but we do our best to clear the slate of Sunday activities so that we can find joy and peace in Jesus, so that we can be restored in him, uh, in his way. So in the morning... Uh, when we pray together at, pr at breakfast, we always take an extended time of prayer. And uh, we pray that God will help us see him, that there will be something fresh, something new uh, that will give us uh, life, uh, spiritual life. Uh, we pray for our pastor. I hope that gets me a point or two. <laughs> <laughs> But we pr I pray for all of us. I pray that the Spirit reigns upon us. I pray Amen. that uh, when we come together, that the distractions, that we'll be able to police ourselves against distractions, and we will just be saying the whole time, Jesus, I want to see you. I want to hear you. What do you have for me? What, what Amen. teaching Amen. do you have? Wh where can Amen. I expand? Where, can mm -hmm. I where am I missing it, Jesus? Mm. I want to be like you. So even the rest of the day, when we spend uh, the afternoon, it's a lot of meditation on Scripture. Linda and I, med I memorize Scripture, and we don't want to lose it, so we try to use part of Sunday to, to review so, so it stays close to us and uh, be involved in that. We love Sunday school. By the oh, we saw it. Disciple shower. Hour. Discipleship hour is Discipleship the hour. same as Sunday school, yes. Because we get to learn from God's Word. And uh, it's, it's so delightful with a group of people to talk and move through it. So that's certainly part of our Sabbath practice. As a little commercial, what time does that happen here at Emmanuel? Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock Sunday mornings. Yes. And we have good options. And, and so the afternoon is, is spent resting or uh, I enjoy going for a walk outside and listening to music. Uh, Christian music and meditating and then uh, church Sunday evening and yeah. another opportunity to get together with God's people. So uh, I know a lot of you do the right things in that area, so we're still in the process. But our desire is to use the day to grow closer to Jesus, to hear his voice, Amen. and to say yes to him. Amen. Thank so. you, Randy. That's good. That's very good, the heart and intention of the Sabbath. Okay, I want to just broaden out uh, for, a, for the last couple of minutes here to, to speak to the fact that Sabbath doesn't have to only happen on the seventh day of the week or first day of the week. That There are also spaces and times that we can create in our lives, maybe an extra day off at times. People call them mental health days. How about we... How about we take the language and turn that to like an extra Sabbath day? Uh, sometimes you can have an extra day off or a, a weekend getaway uh, or a, a extended vacation. Some of you like to hunt or fish. And I hear you say that when I'm out there and I'm hunting and, and I'm in my tree stand, I'm connecting with the Lord uh, in a way that that's, that's kind of an extra Sabbath. Um, how about your vacations? Don't view them as just getting away, right? How can you, how can you vacation to the Lord? How can you enjoy him even on your vacation? Maybe uh, what you're reading or uh, taking some, some extra time. Maybe visiting a church uh, that you, uh, that's not one you've been to before, but going and, and worshiping somewhere else with, with another church. or wh Whatever it may be, how can we include that idea? Another I idea, an extension of, of the Sabbath, and this is my first time ever teaching or preaching on the Sabbath before. This has really been challenging to me, and I'm coming up upon something here this summer that has the same word, root word, but it's bigger. It's sabbatical. All right? So uh, some of you may not know this. This will be serve as your announcement. We've been talking about it for nine months here at the, as the church, uh, but if you've missed it this summer, um, my, 
my family, we're going to be taking a sabbatical uh, away from church responsibilities and duty, church life, and uh, taking time here from uh, late May into the beginning of August, 10 weeks plus uh, a week of a conference that we're going to have uh, that all the pastors are going to, um, but to let the soil lay fallow. Uh, as, as it were. A time of rest and renewal. And I'm so thankful that our church uh, values for their pastors to get renewal. It's in our, our church governing board policy that um, ev- after seven years of ministry, uh, continual ministry at the church, then, then a, a uh, sabbatical is uh, an option for a pastor to take, and they encourage us to do that. Uh, this summer, it will be eight and a half years. Eight and a half years since we came, which is pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> We're grateful to have spent these last eight and a half years with you guys. Uh, when we came, our, our kids were little, and some of you had them in your classes when you were, you were teaching in the kids' rooms and stuff. Now they're in college and high school, and time has, has gone by. And we're really looking forward to this time this summer to be able to refresh, renew, to read, to travel, to spend time as a family, spend extra time uh, with the Lord and uh, even have a, a personal retreat in there. Lisette and I are going to get that together. And so we're, we're excited for this upcoming sabbatical. Um, so I want you to know that. I, I want you to know that that's, that's something that even our church has said, let's apply this to an even greater degree in our church. And, and I want to encourage you, you may not be able to take a sabbatical from your, your job uh, if you're still in your career. Some careers allow that, some don't. Um, Sometimes you just need to have little bits of seasons where you pull back so that you can engage even greater. And that's our desire. Just so you know, we are not interviewing anywhere. We're not putting our resume in anywhere. We're not going looking anywhere. We've been asked those questions. Uh, This is truly for rest and renewal. And we're trusting that as we come back, we'll have even greater vision for what God has ahead in the next season. Um, All the responsibilities that... Lisa and I would normally lead in. We are, we are working uh, together, put, putting a plan together to cover all of those things. We have a, a more than ample, uh, amply gifted staff to, uh, to preach, elders who can preach. We're even going to have our district office uh, leaders. Uh, there are three pastors who serve in our eastern Pennsylvania district. They're each going to preach one of the weeks that I'm away. Uh, Pastor Brett's going to be overseeing the worship ministry. Um, all the things that need to be covered, where we have a written out plan for how to do that. So things won't be dropped. And my prayer is that we'll actually thrive as a church, not just survive, uh, so that things continue to move forward. It's a wonderful gift to a church to realize it doesn't all depend on one person. It's a wonderful gift to me to realize it doesn't all rest on one person. We have a body. And so I, I pray that, that you guys will step up into any open needs that you see and, and, and work together during the summer, and God will actually raise up and strengthen our church during this time. So that's, that's coming ahead. Let's journey together to figure out what it means to Sabbath better unto the Lord. So with that, let me just close this in prayer. Lord Jesus, I want to ask that your word here that has been spoken as we've looked at at what you've had to say, that you will speak into each of our hearts, into our families. You will, Lord, spark our thinking as to how we can rest better in you, rest away from the identity of the world, and that we can Sabbath unto you. Lord, I pray that in each of our lives, you will give us a a clearer direction, a clearer understanding that we might honor the Lord of the Sabbath and experience the kind of freedom to rest like you have. Thank you that you are the all-sufficient one and that we as your people have all of our needs provided in you. May we worship you by putting that into practice, resting in you. We pray this in Jesus' name, through whom all blessings flow. Amen. Amen. May God bless you as you go out now and put this into practice today. And we will see you tonight at our evening service at 7 p.m. God bless you.